Hello everybody, Simon Dixon here and welcome to the second episode of Bitcoin Hard Talk. Uh, the first episode was a huge success. We had Jim Rogers on talking about why he thinks Bitcoin will go to zero and me sharing some different perspectives. Um, in the second episode, I thought I would get on Raoul Powell. So if you haven't heard of Raoul Powell, we're going to be discussing what elite investors think of Bitcoin. And when I was thinking about who to get on, um, I wanted somebody that can bridge the gap between the Bitcoin world and the traditional finance world. And Raoul Powell was first on my list. For those of you that don't know him, he's a former hedge fund manager. He retired at 36. He now lives in the Cayman Island. Um, he co-managed the Goldman Sachs hedge fund sales business in both equity and equity derivatives in Europe. Um, and he's now a, runs a business called Real Vision um, and writes to a global macro investor, which is essentially a research uh, firm and media outlet for hedge funds, family offices, sovereign wealth funds, and other elite investors. So this is, now you can see why I wanted Raoul Powell on for this topic. So we started the episode by discussing his views on the current environment, um, his journey from uh, Goldman Sachs to Bitcoin. Um, and then we moved to why and how uh, many traditional investors have made the tradition from traditional finance to Bitcoin and why many of the gold investors are skeptical and other topics that, we've, that I thought were uh, really interesting. So we'll head over to the interview and hope you enjoy this one. And I'll see you on the other side and let us know what you think in the comments section. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So I've got uh, Raoul Powell with us today, and I'm really excited about having him on Bitcoin Hard Talk, um, mainly for a couple of reasons. Um, so Raoul comes from traditional finance, as we talked about in the intro, um, and he's had this amazing channel, Real Vision, and the membership um, port community, um, and gets to speak to many traditional investors, macro investors, um, and discuss all things traditional finance. Um, but also was involved at some stage in the crypto community. So why don't you give us your, your backstory of um, your, your journey from traditional finance to actually thinking that there might be something behind this crazy Bitcoin thing? Yeah, so I was deep in the traditional finance community and still am. So, you know, my background was at Goldman Sachs, where I started and ran the hedge fund sales business and equities and equity derivatives. And then after that, I went and started a global macro hedge fund for the biggest hedge fund firm in Europe called GLG Partners. Uh, ran that for several years and then decided to opt out of the rat race and write investment strategy and research for the Mediterranean coast of Spain. So in doing that, so I left for Spain in 2005. My um, subscribers to the research service are all the world's biggest macro hedge funds, sovereign wealth funds, big family offices, asset management firms and investment banks. And... Um, during you know, three years after moving there, the financial crisis came, which I was kind of part of the group predicting it. And a lot of the people who were part of that big short were all clients of mine. So we kind of knew what was going on. Um, then the European crisis came in 2012. And I was in Spain where I saw we were about to lose the banking system. And I saw the societal shifts that were going on. You know, we'd seen Occupy Wall Street. We'd seen all of this stuff. And, and what it was telling me, and I've been looking at the whole debt-based system that we've had, and it was telling me there was time for a change and people wanted change. And around that time, I started hearing about Bitcoin, didn't know much about it, but was observing what was going on in, as a, it was an interesting idea to me. It then came to me where one of my subscribers, another ex-Goldman guy, had, was a hedge fund guy based in New York. He'd heard about it early on, back in 2010. And he started mining Bitcoin because he had free electricity in his office. So he thought, I'll give this a go. So he started mining Bitcoin and suddenly realized the potential. I and mean, he was mining at like 17 cents or 20 cents. It was ridiculous. Um, and we had a, um, a global macro investor roundtable, my research service roundtable in Spain. And he came to talk, you know, and participate in it. And he just started saying, listen, you need to focus on this Bitcoin thing. I'm like, I'm not really sure what it's all about. So he sat down and explained a bit to me. And because we were basically still in the middle of this financial crisis in Europe, it resonated massively that this was a potential answer. So back in about 2013, I first invested in Bitcoin. I also wrote a paper which was looking at the stock to flow model of Bitcoin versus gold at a very top down macro. So not like plan B does with the full maths. That's beyond my capability set. 
but it was all about understanding, okay, what could this thing be worth? Because nobody put a macro framework around it yet. It had really come from the technology sector, um, the kind of libertarian technology sector had driven it. And so people didn't know what it was worth in macro terms. So I wrote a paper in Global Macro Investor and that kind of went viral and went around Silicon Valley and elsewhere where people started to say, actually, this is a macro instrument. Um, so I, you know, I bought it, eventually end up selling in 2017, too early, um, because we saw the forking happen. And I'm like, I don't really understand what this is all about. I don't know where it's going to go. So the probabilities of success have lowered somewhat to me. So my beginning of the journey was understanding that Bitcoin was an answer to the issue of fiat currency. By the time I got, by 2017, I started realizing it potentially was the answer to an entire financial system. By the time I got to about 2018, 19, um, and got back in again, I realized that Bitcoin and this whole digital asset space was now rapidly becoming a parallel financial universe that was being built out while we saw the old financial universe potentially coming somewhere towards its logical conclusion. So that's been my journey and I've been fascinated by it. And I think many of the macro guys I know have gone through the same journey because our job as macro guys is look at the big picture. What was the big picture that we've had? Well, we've got this demographic issues in, in developed countries. And against that, that tends to drive down growth. So debt exploded as a way of juicing up growth. Um, and then that kind of just got carried away with itself. And we got the financialization of the global economy. And so we all realized it was unsustainable. We realized from 2000 onwards, and it was a matter of which crisis would end this. So I think most of the macro players had realized this. And the macro returns were driving lower and lower and lower as central banks were dampening volatility in the global markets. So people were looking for something different. I think Dan Moorhead was the first person to move across from the macro world. He was ex-Tiger, one of the biggest hedge funds in the world. Uh, he saw this opportunity and pounced on it. Um, and then people like Mark Yusko, Mike Novogratz, and all of this macro community, Dan Tapiero, the whole macro community started. And by 2019, you know, all the big hedge fund managers generally had a small private arm that was investing in this space. Um, it wasn't yet part of their portfolios. And now we're starting to see the evolution. I mean, again, people like Passport Capital, John Burbank, who's very famous in this space, he closed down his global macro hedge fund and said, right, this is the next opportunity. I'm just going to do this. And then we saw Paul Tudor Jones make the public statement about that he's coming into the space, which was the most anybody had done publicly, even though many of them were in it privately. So that's kind of how I got into it. And everybody's involved in it. But it's still nascent because their funds aren't involved. Hmm. Interesting. So let's, um, that's really great to get an overview. And I can see the journey that you've been through. Um, there's a lot of parallels because I, I was working in investment banking, left 2006 um, to give talks on the problems with fiat currencies. Um, right. That led me to Bitcoin. But let me ask from your perspective, um, what, what is the problem that you see with fiat currencies? I don't have a problem per se with fiat currencies. It's how you manage the supply of it is the issue. And again, what we've learned is that what everybody thought would be inflationary or catastrophic, which was you know, a net increase in money supply, actually wasn't. So that whole monetary theory stuff has turned pretty much into hogwash. But we do know that there is a payoff at the end. And that payoff appears to be the relative valuation of fiat currencies over time versus hard assets such as gold. We also saw it in the art markets. We've seen it in the wine markets. We've seen it in the classic car markets. Things that are perceived to hold value over time that are rare assets have done very well over the last two decades. Um, so the fiat money issue is, okay, the Fiat money allowed more creation of bank credit. And that whole credit creation became the instability within the system. And Fiat allowed that. Although, you know, again, I don't really believe in what the gold guys say is the world was perfect before we moved off the gold standard because we've all, everybody's had a financial crisis and everybody pegged to gold has ended up leaving it. So it's not that gold is the answer to everything, but I think the moving away from the gold standard and the Reagan-Thatcher years, if you think of those, really interesting. And Thatcher was probably the first person to do it. 
So Britain in the late 1970s was a pretty miserable place. And she needed to stimulate economic growth. The problem is, is for her voters, many of them were still, um, the, the, the voting population was still kind of labor orientated because we had the unions, et cetera, and she'd been fighting with them. So how do you appease that group of people you've been fighting with? Well, the, the clever idea, and it was a very good idea, which was to sell the council houses. So that's the, the free housing that people were able to live in, sell them to the people who were living in them. So to financialize them in the economy. Okay, great idea. The issue was, is you brought a bunch of creditors and turned them into debtors overnight. And there comes the debt-based economy. Now you've got a house, you've got an asset, therefore you can have more debts on your credit card and the bank will lend you more money. And before you know it, you create this consumer debt cycle. Meanwhile, we, and, and Reagan followed similar policies of liberating um, credit creation. And then the banks see that, and they've also driven investments in pensions, the 401k market in the US. And that gave a huge pool of assets of which they can financialize as well. And before you know it, everybody's financializing everything. And that starts showing the fragilities of the fiat system when suddenly you're getting to the point where it becomes too much and the value of these currencies starts falling versus hard assets. And do you think that um, the, the, the innovation of new ways of creating debt, so you talked about um, allowing people to have home ownership in council flats, was really an innovation around how to get more mortgages or how to get more, uh, more people into debt, would you say? I don't know at that point whether the financial firms had figured all that out. But I think after Big Bang in the UK, which was a really big moment, not just in the UK, but globally, where, and the, and the uh, dissolution of Glass-Steagall in the US, basically stopped, meant that banks could take more risk because they didn't have to be partnerships. They didn't have to segregate risk. Then there was another moment in time that I think was really important. It was Salomon Brothers who first did it. They went public, followed by Goldman. So all the partnerships, Lehman, all of them, Bear Stearns were all partnerships. So if you're a partner, you're more risk averse because you don't want to lose your own personal capital. But when they become public companies, there is no limit to the risk because the market and the central bank will give them infinite amounts of capital. So all of these things came together and it's really that big bang period, which was 87, that suddenly it started to take off. And by the 90s, this cycle of debt, pension fund allocation, financialization became enormous. So I don't think it was the, I think Thatcher was trying to buy voters. And I think to bring people into the economy and out of the unions, was a clever thing to do at that point in time. I don't think she really realized where this was gonna go. And I think it, it was really a marker point because Reagan saw what she was doing and thought that it was very clever to change the mood of a nation by bringing people into the financial world. And the banks just abused it as ever. Mm. And what about, do you, do you feel that all of this is really just an inevitability that if you, if you, if you think of it on the, you know, the macro scale, how a fiat currency is created, well, a bank issues a loan, a new digital currency is created, um, it's backed by debt, um, and you enter into this phase where there's always going to be a new innovation in debt in order to try and you know, grow. Um, do you think that all of these innovations are just kind of symptoms and inevitability of a system it well, always has to have more debt to grow. Well, look at GDP growth per unit of debt. It keeps declining. So it's harder and harder to grow GDP by debt. Back in the early 80s, it was easy because it was limited debt. So it has a net accretive effect on the economy. But after a while, it doesn't because of debt servicing. It becomes harder and harder to generate GDP growth and you, you reduce overall productivity. So I think... There is that inevitability, but these are long-term time horizons and everyone's very quick to say, well, it's gonna blow up now. My view has always been that this recession was likely gonna be the one. So before we knew a recession was coming, I was like, next recession, we're pretty close to Japan ending up buying all of its government bonds. And then we've reached the logical conclusion of what does that mean? What does it do? And so now we've got this enormous recession going on. I just think if any of us are right, that any of this is meaningful. 
if debt and money supply and fiat currencies, if any of this means anything, the whole macro perspective, then it's going to play out now. You can't have the biggest recession in the UK in 300 years. And if that doesn't blow up a debt bubble, nothing's ever going to do it. In which case, central banks have won. We can all go home because there is no investing business. It's fascinating, but it, it feels to me that we've, the event horizon has now met with the technology that Bitcoin had created and has met with the financialization and they've all collided at one big point and we're going to see the outcome. Yeah, and if, we, if there's one common theme that I think comes from whoever you interview that's got an opinion in this space that means something, is that there is a feeling that something is happening now, um, and no matter how much logic you try and apply to the situation, um, we have found ourselves in what feels like a very unique situation. Um, I know many people, if you listen to the Ray Dalios of this world, they'll show you, well, we've been here before, and this is just simply a, another debt cycle. Do you think that history already has the answers, or do you think we've actually um, reached a new phase that, that history hasn't got answers to yet? No. I think there's an arrogance within central banking and a belief in the omnipotence of central banks that makes the assumption that the Federal Reserve now and the central banks of today are smarter and better than the central bank of 300 years ago in the UK or Holland or Sweden. And, and I don't think that's the case. I think they've just forgotten the lessons of history. So if the big lesson from history of the central banks, and we've heard this from Greenspan onwards, is don't go into deflation because we've got a lot of debt, right? That's the hidden narrative. So anything to stop that, so wind forward to 2020, where are we? At their worst fear, zero interest rates and deflation. So that means that real rates rise. So the cost of debt servicing goes up in the middle of a recession. That's what happened in the 1930s and that's all they've ever tried to, tried to avoid. They created it. Most of us, by if we have a big fear, we tend to make that fear manifest itself because we take such evasive actions that it ends up bringing it about. So it's kind of, we've got to that stage now where it feels that, okay, what are they gonna do? Now, the only answer they have currently in their rule book is more. And that's what Bitcoin and gold are sniffing out right now. If the answer to their biggest fear is to repeat the same behavior, that is when you reach the tipping point because there are no interest rates to cut. Yes, they'll go negative. But what does that leave? What does that, what does that do? We're already seeing the global banking system under pressure. European banks, the UK banks, uh, the Japanese banks. If you look at the long-term charts, all look in deep trouble. And so you mentioned uh, Japan earlier, which I think is a really interesting case because um, I think everyone throughout the last decade or even 20 years, you know, has used Japan as this interesting case of uh, everything being wrong with economy that could be wrong with economy, and yet they seem to be okay. You know, they put interest rates down to zero. They invented quantitative sure. easing. Um, and, uh, you know, they have incredible levels of debt. Um, they, you know, so what, what can we learn from, from so Japan? So we learned that... Japanification was everybody's fear. And what have we done? Created Japanification. The UK interest rates went negative three weeks ago. We've done, we've done exactly what we feared, right? Which is my point. We always do this. But what did Japan get right that meant they allowed it to drag on? Okay, they had two things to their benefit. One was time. Their aging population is 10 to 15 years older because they didn't have the, um, a baby boom. 10 to 15 years older than the rest of the developed world. So their demographic issues played out earlier and not at the same time as everybody else. Everybody else from Europe, which is like five years older, to the US, to the UK, all have, and Australia, Canada, New Zealand, they've all got the same age population, give or take a spread, right? And it's this baby boomers. Now, those guys are going to go into retirement altogether and need to divest of assets and change their consumption patterns because, you know, anybody who's got retired parents notice how much less they spend and all of that stuff and how much more they put into 
fixed income, so they lower bond yields by doing it. But the Japanese did that when everybody else was still growing. So they didn't have that problem, and they had one other trick up their sleeve, is they'd actually bothered to save money. So even though the Japanese have a huge amount of government debt, I think they're still a net creditor nation, meaning they have more savings than they have in debt. And that's mm. the difference. Um, but you know, their corporate sector was the real problem. And their corporate sector went on to the banks, and the banks have remained a mess for years and years and years and years. Mm. But it never went away. They just didn't have a big bang moment. My guess is they'll only have a big bang moment when everybody else does too. Interesting. And, and from your perspective, now is that big bang moment globally? You know, I only deal in probabilities because there are no certainties in our world. And I would say the probability of it being during the largest recession of all time, or at least in our lifetimes, has got to be high. If not, this global economy and this whole monetary system is much more resilient than we could ever imagine. And we've got it all wrong then. Yeah. I just, so it's just probabilistically, common sense level, it's like, okay, it's got to be now, probably. Yeah. Um, well, I do think that there is one trick up the central bank's um, sleeve that hasn't actually been used yet. And it really relates to the crypto conversation. Um, and that is in, in 2016, I uploaded a video on how um, when everything goes to where I think it is today, um, they'll let banks go bust um, and de replace depositors' money with a central bank digital currency. Um, and so, you know, we, we move into a world where essentially uh, the central bank starts taking on banks that are in, um, in scenarios like they are in, you know, that, that might come. Um, what, what do you think about what we're seeing with, with central bank digital currencies? Do you see this as a, as a likely outcome? Um, well, yes. I mean, I, I think Europe has to nationalize its banks, and I think the UK will have to do the same. So I, and I think Japan will have to do the same. So what do you deal with there? I mean, the digital currency idea makes the direct connection between state and its people very easily. So you know, can, they, can they introduce monetary policy in a more fair way? And stuff like that. That's how they'll justify it, for sure. Um, so I think that is a likely way. And then you could let the new world of DeFi and everything else build out the infrastructure for lending and credit and all the other bits. So you kind of restart. I don't have a problem with restarting. And I don't have a problem with the fact that you know, things like Bitcoin fit into the middle of that. Because I just think of Bitcoin as a personal reserve currency. So I get to choose. Now, if they've got digital on-ramps and off-ramps, that makes it easier for me. And I think commerce will be a lot easier with digital basket currencies like Libra and stuff like that. So I think it's a positive thing. I'm less concerned about the banks going because I don't think they deserve to stay in the current format because banks have done an appalling job at managing risk um, in what they do. And so they're part of the problem along with the central bank. Now, does this mean you get rid of central banks as well? That would be the logical conclusion, probably. And I think that would make sense too. It's just a different world. And I don't fear change. I'm interested in it. And I don't know whether it's catastrophic or brilliant to do that. But I do know that it's going to lead to massive opportunities in the digital asset space and the new digital world. And so for that, I get excited by it. And I worry less about, okay, what does it mean? Because... I've already moved my head forward into the new space. Yeah. Um, and really, that's all you can do at the moment. You can use these, you know, conversations to drive you into fear. Um, or you can actually think about the opportunities that arise from a shift because a shift is simply, you know, um, a shift from old to a shift to new and, and you getting your, yourself in the right position. Now, the challenging part about that is um, forecasting what comes next. And I think you know, that's where traditional hedging strategies come. We don't know what comes next, but you can be prepared for lots of different outcomes. Yes, and the way I've done that is, look, you know, a trade and invest, I still think the US dollar, because there's a shortage of it versus the amount of debt, probably goes up. But into this other world, you know, I've got a lot more Bitcoin than I own gold, but I own gold and Bitcoin. And I don't think Bitcoin as a currency yet. I still think of it as a call option on the future. And so... 
I know that if the probabilities rise, Bitcoin is going up. And guess what? If Bitcoin doesn't go up, gold will go up. Probably they both go up. So I feel like it's actually a pretty balanced approach to think about the future. And that leaves me to concentrate on building a business, investing in other stuff, and not having to worry about the future because I've got call options on it all and they don't expire. So it kind of, you know, that's how I square it away. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing bet because we can continue to do other stuff. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I've, um, we, I think we come from a, a similar philosophy that um, let's say the government, the governments of this world sit around a table, renegotiate what money is. Um, US dollar and US dollar denominated assets are probably going to try and um, be an important part of that because 70% of the world's currency now is, is dollars. Um, probably how much gold these central banks have will determine how much of a, a seat at the table they get. Um, and in case, you know, so you need exposure to US dollar denominated assets because we might continue the status quo. But then if you don't, then gold becomes an important player. And from my perspective, the, a bit the, a lot of the, the, the gold people um, get a, a bit wrong is underestimating the importance of self-custody. Um, because when you own a lot of gold, inevitably you end up having to store it in Switzerland or you have to store it in Singapore. And the time when you're gonna want your gold the most is probably lockdown two when you can't actually fly, you can't get to your gold, um, and you understand the importance of actually having a hedge against gold, which is where self-custody and um, being able to store something of large value um, close to yourself actually is ultra, ultra complementary to gold. And so why, why, do, why is there so much resistance from your experience um, between these three different parties, traditional finance, uh, the gold people that understand the problem with these traditional US dollar denominated assets, and then Bitcoiners uh, just think uh, gold is this ancient relic. What, where, where do these three people meet? Before I answer that question, I'm going to give you a story that I think is really interesting to me. And it made me understand gold and crisis. So a lot of the gold community have focused on cataclysm. Right? When, when the fabric of society falls apart, you need gold. Right? That's, the, that's the mentality. I get it. What was brilliant was in 2004, three, Argentina fell apart. And it had the Coralito where they, they, they had a dual currency system, so you could have dollars in your account and pesos in your account. What they did is converted all the dollars into pesos and then devalued the peso by 90%, right? Basically destroyed everybody. Wiped out all the middle classes. The wealthy had already got off in their private jets with their gold bars. So how did the economy function when you do something like that? Well, what was fascinating is there's a guy who wrote a blog about it all the way through. And you got to learn how it plays out. What had value? Well, what was interesting is anywhere outside of Buenos Aires and Mendoza and a few other places, the big cities, gold bars and gold coins didn't because nobody knew how to value it. Was it 24 karat gold? Was it 18 karat gold? Was it nine karat gold? Right, so everything, what happened was all gold got haircut to jewelry prices. So they assumed for the average guy, like you and I, I wouldn't know what was 24 or 22 or 18. So they just went, fine, it's all 18 karat gold. And so what traded was wedding rings and bracelets and necklaces. Because gold coins, the guys who owned it said, but this is not worth 18 karat gold. This is 24 karat pure gold. And they're like, we don't care. I can't prove it. I'm just a simple farmer who just wants to sell you, you know, meat or whatever it was. So it didn't work. It worked for the rich but didn't work for everybody else. And I thought that was fascinating because Bitcoin doesn't have that issue because its value is its value. Um, and it's, it's it, because it's trusted, you know, it, it's immutable and trusted and everything else, there is no question what it is. So that all goes away. So it becomes a perfect exchange of value. But the rest of the world don't see the traditional finance guys. Most of them know it's screwed. There's very few who don't really. You've seen all the central bankers leave and then tell the truth, right? From Greenspan onwards. So they know that it's unsustainable, but their job they're being paid to do 
is to try and sustain it. And anything to do with investments, particularly fiat currencies, is all about trust. And if you, don't, if, if you can keep the Wizard of Oz, then it's all got value. If it hasn't, it doesn't have value. And gold is the same, really. If people don't trust it as a medium of exchange, then it has no value. It's just a metal. It's just that we ascribe as humans a value to it. So it's very interesting when you go through a situation that gold people don't consider, that it doesn't always have the value that they think it has. But crypto gets around that, and it gets around the portability issue. The gold guys will argue, there's two arguments that they have. One, well, electricity. Well, I'm like, okay, fine. Let's say all the electricity well has gone, then everything that's stored on the blockchain is still stored on the blockchain. Every transaction that happens afterwards will appear, and guess what? You can have solar panels, you know, batteries. There's a number of ways that you and I can exchange cryptocurrency without a grid. So that's not an argument. And if the whole grid goes down, we're probably in the end of the world. We've been hit by a meteorite or something. So that's not really an issue. I don't, I don't get it. But that's the gold thing. You can't destroy it. But you can't really destroy Bitcoin unless you have no electricity forever. So, you know, I don't think they get that. And the other thing is quantum compute. Oh, well, the quantum compute, which is the same argument that we might use with the gold community to say, well, if you look at that meteorite over there, they've got tons of gold. And if, that, if we can mine that, all gold is worthless. Okay, how do you price that tail? The tail of the distribution. I don't know, but it's a long way away. What is interesting is it creates an arms race within cryptocurrency, which is to build quantum layers of protection. That's okay. I think an arms race, that will probably work fine because there's equally smart people in this space as there are in the quantum computing space. So, you know, again, I'm not particularly concerned by it. The traditional world thinks that anybody who talks about these things has a tin hat on and is worried about the sky falling in. But what I'm noticing is they're noticing Bitcoin and crypto and digital assets for the other reason, which is they smell the profit incentive of creating something new and, and disrupting the traditional financial architecture and creating new monopolies and new giant firms and new opportunities. So they are starting to come to that. So you see a lot of them eventually leave the finance space and move into, into the crypto space. Mm, interesting. Um, and, you know, I, I don't, even if those things do happen, so let, let's say that, you know, that we enter a world where the internet's down and then electricity's down. Um, just because that might happen is not a reason to not own Bitcoin. Um, just because I think that you might not be able to access your gold in Switzerland one day is not a reason for me to not own gold. Correct. What you're doing is you're taking different risk scenarios and preparing for different eventualities. So if we are in that scenario where electricity is down, then I'll say, well, firstly, Bitcoin might still work on the satellite. It, uh, it, you know, it's going to be a, a rebuilding process, but that's the moment when I want my gold. Um, but you know, it, it doesn't mean just because that could happen that you don't, pro ha you know, you don't put yourself in a position where you're preparing for multiple outcomes. Yeah. So if you look at the risk side, which are those two sides, I think, well put, if I look at the opportunity side, what is the upside, right? That's the risk reward is the game we're in. Well, the opportunity side for gold is that fiat currencies collapse and the value of gold rises. Fine. What does it go up? 5x, 10x? We're already right near the all-time inflation adjusted high. So whatever the number is. But with, with Bitcoin, it has that other added tail, which is that potential future. So that, you know, for me, it, it just, it, I like the, the combination of both, but I can just see that one has a much larger upside than the other. So I'll even take more risk. I don't mind more risk because the return is so much higher because let's say it's 100x. Well, so if I can lose everything and make 100, not that I think you lose everything, and in gold, what's 5x, the risk reward is vastly different because the probability of a new financial system coming from gold is close to zero. Could it have a place in it? It always will do. It's always a reserve asset for anybody who wants it. It's not going away. 
but it's not going to play, unlikely to play a role in a future financial system. So therefore, its future expected value is less. Well, and for political reasons only, because the largest, you know, the, the, the countries that produce the most amount of gold or have the central banks that have the highest gold to GDP ratios um, are not necessarily the US. That's Russia, that's Germany, uh, that's China. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a polit- This is what I've been trying to say to people is you're, you don't know what the politicians are going to do. Um, and right now we're no longer in market forces. I don't believe we're in markets anymore. I believe we're playing what politicians are going to do next, what central banks are going to do next. So, you know, in the case of Japan, um, you, you were talking about they own half of all the assets. So that's not really a market. Um, and we're moving that way, it seems, with, you know, all the policies as a result of this health crisis um, towards central banks owning all assets and being the, you know, the, the people behind the debt. And I think we've even seen things like the, you know, the, the Swiss central bank um, buying foreign stocks, not even stocks in their own country. Um, so, we, you know, we, we're seeing these, these are not markets. Um, these are... And I, think it, I think it's not only politics, but there's a shift towards when things get more extreme, what becomes more extreme is behavior. So we've become into the world of behavioral economics and game theory, where because they're getting squeezed into, into a corner they become more predictable in what they're trying to do because it's not a free market any longer. There's no free market in interest rates and there's probably not a free market in equities and there's certainly not a free market in bonds and there's no free market in credit any longer. And so what you're doing is corralling them into a certain behavior pattern of which is is actually predictable, which is again why I like the bets about gold and Bitcoin because the outcome is predictable. As you say, there's some other interesting ones which is does it all corral onto the balance sheet of the central bank? And then do they create a digital currency to get around this and reset the system? Well, the probability is there for sure. But the fact is, is we know the only answer they have is more. Mm. And, you know, that's great because that gives us a, once you understand their behavior, it makes it pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, let us know. So I think um, let's sh- shift gears slightly and, help us understand a bit about um, Raoul and what, what excites you at the moment. Um, what, what are you involved with at the moment? So I think, uh, you know, you've got real vision. Um, help, us, uh, help us understand what, what, what you're thinking about at the moment. Yeah, so I do a number of things. So I have Global Macro Investor, which is my kind of very kind of high-end research business for hedge funds and stuff. So I spend a lot of time and I've been doing that for 15 years. It's one of the longest standing of these you know, large research services. And I've, I still run that to this day. I write about 130 pages a month. And what I basically do is use my global macro framework that I've learned for my 30 years career in, in kind of the macro world and the hedge fund world. So I'm analyzing all markets, all assets globally at all times based around a framework of the business cycle and then these big secular cycles we're talking about. So that's my wheelhouse, the global macro world. I do that. In back in about 2007, YouTube had launched and a friend of mine was running ITV in London at the time. And I said, what do you think this YouTube thing? He goes, I said, it's a, I said, it's a bunch of cat videos. Why do you care? He goes, I'm, I'm concerned by it. I said, why is that? He goes, I pay a hundred million pounds for a broadcasting license. It's now worth zero. I'm like, huh? He said, video on demand technology is so disruptive, people don't even understand it yet. I said, okay, well, so you as a large incumbent in the UK, what are you gonna do about it? He said, nothing. We saw what the music industry did and we saw what the publishing industry did and we don't wanna screw up, so we'll wait. And I'm like, that's fascinating. Here's a big macro trend coming and everybody's paralyzed, which is kind of what's happening in crypto. It's a similar kind of thing, right? Um, so that got me into the, the idea that video had something then the financial crisis came along and I realized that I knew what was going on. I had access to everybody, but somebody else didn't. And people come up to me in the street between this period and the, and the banking crisis in Europe and would say, well, why don't we know, Ralph? And I'm like, well, I don't know. So I went to look at it and I just realized the media let people down. So 
and I thought that was wrong. You know, I've been at the center of this and why should I have more information than others? Sure, I can, I do my homework and think about it, but people at the basic level weren't getting the right information. And so I realized that there was an opportunity and it, fast forward to 2013, um, four of us got together over a dinner in Spain and we realized that video was probably the solution to telling people or giving people access to the information that they wanted. So I became really interested in the media world, the rise of video and the whole entrepreneurial model. Because, you know, yes, I've been an entrepreneur, set up a research service, but now I'm trying to be an entrepreneur at scale. And that's been a fascinating, really bloody hard, super exciting journey. So I'm very interested in that. I'm very interested in business models going into the future. I'm very interested in how media evolves because it's still not clear. There's still a huge war going on to try and decide where the media business goes. Within this, I'm massively excited about the crypto space for the reasons we talked about, the whole digital asset space, because I, if you look at the history of media, these things go hand in hand, because you know, gaming started tokens. Now that's where it came from. And so digital assets have a value. And I see that and it came out of the media world and all of this is kind of colliding and with my macro world as well. So it's kind of, there's a lot that interests me around in the world. And other than that, you know, I'm a, fanatic traveler you know I'm a, you know grew up with parents from different countries and different cultures and I've lived in England India Spain and now I live in the Cayman Islands so you know against a network of that is what I'm interested in mm, yeah well our business is based in Cayman it's a it's an area I've uh, spent some time in so uh, how how have they been with uh, the lockdown and, and phenomenally good the Cayman's a really interesting place because there is a Unlike the rest of the Caribbean, there's a huge professional class here. Um, and that attracts some really high quality people who run businesses and infrastructure that come with experience that a small island wouldn't normally get so fast. It's also incredibly entrepreneurial as an island. So the, the Caymanian entrepreneurs themselves are really amazing. And it's a very entrepreneurial place. So given that set of people and the culture they see this coming, and I was one of the first people to really raise the alarm in the Cayman Islands, uh, along with a friend of mine who uh, I persuaded over a lunch about who runs the hospital, like, well, we've got to do something here. And he went, you know, the governor, you know, he spoke to the government and, and the health services authorities. And what they did was completely shut down everybody. They had a hard, hard lockdown, closed the borders. And said, right, we're just going to test as many people as possible because we're a small country and we can do it. And we've got facilities. They, imported, they brought in a scientist from Australia to help them with structuring the COVID test to improve on the WHO version of it. And so far, they've tested 30% of the people. They did it early enough that the viral loads on Ireland are very low. And they've managed to now start reopening internal economy, but will keep the external economy closed. And they're now going to use this. We've got very little virus on Ireland. Uh, we had one death, and that came from a cruise ship. But what they're going to do is now use this as an opportunity to rebuild the internal economy, much like Singapore's doing, to say, how do we build a, a more anti-fragile internal economy that we don't require cruise ships or others? Now, the financial services industry was a big part of that because nothing happened to it. It can carry on doing business. And they're like, OK, so we can do this. One of the things they're looking at doing is bringing the digital assets business to Cayman. So there's a big initiative called Digital Cayman, which is about building this new future because they understand finance, they understand financial services, and here's a new opportunity to create a financial center for the new future that doesn't live in London or elsewhere. And like people like you and so many others have most of their legal work done in Cayman Islands. A lot of their accounting expertise for all of this, I mean, basically the entire ICO business came out of Cayman. Um, you know, the lawyers here are incredibly good at this kind of stuff, you know, financial innovation. So yeah. It's a, it's a very interesting place. They, they dealt with, the, with COVID really well. And yes, the economy is going to hurt for a long time. They also did another interesting thing is they let people withdraw money from their pension plans. So the government didn't have to pay everything. So they mm. said you can take 25% out of your pension plan. You know, you understand the risk. This is your robbing from your future. But this way you get to support yourself um, and give you a chance to rebuild savings later without putting a share all on the government balance sheet. And that was a great idea too. Yeah, I've, I've, I've found um, these islands are really fascinating places for the innovation. So um, here at the Isle of Man, it's a similar story. The Isle of Man, um, it was the first government that invited um, us to speak 
at a, you know, a, a Bitcoin conference in 2014. Um, interestingly, at Bank to the Future, we were the first ever business um, in crypto. So we, we've been, it was around 2010 that we first started. And wow. uh, we started investing in many of the exchanges from like Kraken to Bitstamp and um, allowing others to invest in equity online. But we, we had a made from, from 2010 to about 2013, 14 was how long it took us to get regulators to try and understand what we wanted to do. Um, but from the moment I, I personally went to move to Hong Kong and then we found the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority um, that actually in a very short period of time uh, were able to understand our business and uh, you know, allow for something that you know, investing in the equity of crypto companies um, was a very traditional business because it's just simply equity that we were trying to do online. But because the businesses were all companies like Kraken and Bitstamp and Bitfinex and all that, um, it was a really, really challenging thing to do anywhere else. Yet Cayman Islands, uh, they, you know, they gave us that shot. Um, they, they were able to regulate us. We were able to do that. Um, and it allowed us to actually fund many of the businesses that no venture capitalist was investing in at the time. Um, wow. These companies all went on to build the, you know, the industry that we know today. Um, so it, it, it was yeah. jurisdictions like Cayman that actually allowed us to... And, uh, and Cayman, as you know, is not a loose jurisdiction. You know, you try opening a bloody strict. bank account here. It's a very strict, well-regulated, uh, with a great legal structure, but they understand financial innovation and their place in it. I mean, certainly, the, you know, you look at the processes that our investors have to go through to onboard onto our platform. Um, you know, th this, is, this is strict processes, so it's not... But they they're supporting innovation, um, yeah. and one of the things I think is really interesting. So um, here on the island, we have the the Manx pound, um, and essentially it's pegged to the British pound. Um, but they create their own paper money, uh, so they already have all of the legal framework to create their own version of the pound. Um, but when they started supporting Bitcoin in 2014, the Bank of England. Uh, got on the phone to the regulators and the government saying, you're going down the wrong path here. Um, if you support this industry, um, you know, uh, not in those exact words, but we're going to remove clearing to the island into the Bank of England system. Um, and so what I think is really interesting is the opportunity for a country like this to be, um, you know, dedicate some of their electricity towards mining Bitcoin um, build a version of the pound, but a digital version, uh, because they've already done it with the paper version of it. So why not do it with a digital version um, and stable coins? And I think the, you know, the, the resistance of these larger jurisdictions that have got so much to lose versus small islands um, setting the model and really gaining power by supporting this industry is what I think will be a real game theoretical situation of countrywide FOMO in our industry. Yeah, and I want to do the same in Cayman is, is to get them to look at doing the same. We have a peg currency to the US dollar. Um, and I'm like, well, why don't you have a stable coin? Why don't you just turn it digital? Because there's no tax here, so it doesn't make a difference to the government. They pay import duty. So anything that comes in through the border, they capture. So it's actually a very easy system for the government to get, and they, they charge for work permits and licenses and stuff like that. So they don't worry about payments. So the issue of cash versus no cash goes away here because nobody cares. There was once a brilliant survey that went around the Cayman Islands that said, you know, they were doing a survey to try and understand um, household savings and GDP and all this stuff that they don't know. And the most common answer from Caymanians was none of your business <laughs> because it, it doesn't, they don't need to know. I mean, you don't need to publish accounts here because it doesn't matter because there's no taxes. It's, yeah. it's, it's a fascinating way of doing it. But yeah, I've been meaning to talk to them about, about doing the same thing. It's a very similar setup to the Isle of Man. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I think we're, you know, we're, we're, we're just about done with the interview. I think we could carry on for hours. It's been a fascinating time. Um, I'm looking forward to coming on to Real Vision. Um, you had a conference the other day and I was one of the panels on there. Um, and looking forward to doing another. Yeah, interview. we've been a big leader in the in the space. I mean, I think our first crypto content was 2014 when we launched our second ever piece, 
was about, it was called The End Game, and it was talking about, you know, where this could lead to and what it meant for things like Bitcoin, which people weren't very familiar with. And we used to get pushback all the time from then. And then we've kind of built all of that out. So yes, we'd definitely love to have you on, talk about your experiences, because you've seen a bunch of stuff. And if anybody watching this, we've got a YouTube channel as well. So you don't even need to pay for a subscription if you want to see what our content's like. So it's real vision. Brilliant. Okay. Um, okay. Well, so what, one final thing then, a final thought. What would you, what advice would you give to um, people that are trying to make sense of this economy and plan, you know, their, their next moves? I think let's answer that from two, two people. One is somebody that's actually got savings. They're concerned about their, um, their investments and what they should be doing. And then what about the people that actually are just in these debt cycles? They've, they've, uh, you know, they've gotten the wrong side of this economy. They've done what the government wanted them to do, take on a lot of debt and they don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. Is this an exciting time? Is there something for them in this economy? What would you leave them with? Well, it depends on your age. If you're a baby boomer, you're pretty much screwed. You just need to hope that as the shift goes from favoring the 1%, it starts to favor the 99%, which I think is gonna happen. So as the pendulum shifts, hopefully people's pensions will get supported, et cetera. Problem is, is that makes more monetary problems for the rest of us. But so, you know, there, there is an issue there, but you know, if you're, if you're a pensioner, just expect lower future income. If you have an expectation of that and lower your cost of living, you're fine. If you can move in with your kids, because two generations together, fine. Because millennial kids can't afford to buy a house because there's too many of these millennials and they're all bidding up the prices too much. And then we've got this monetary phenomena going on as well that bids up the price of hard assets. So, you know, you can move in with your parents. The, your parents have to adjust what you expect out of life. And those two things alone create a huge change for anybody. The other thing is to invest in yourself. Right now, it's the easiest time in history to start a business and generate any income. You can generate, you know, a few hundred bucks a month by something online. Well, that might be the difference between getting yourself into deep trouble or getting through. So invest in yourself, be an entrepreneur, even if it's a small way, it will make a difference and it'll open up bigger opportunities. For everybody else, change is coming and be the right side of change. Fighting change usually doesn't help. And so there are opportunities within this to really move the dial. Um, it's very rare that in our lifetimes, we see such opportunities and such tectonic shifts. I talked about the media industry for tectonic shift, the, um, the music industry, the um, publishing industry, all of these things, right? That was the Mark Andreessen software is eating the world. It is, it's destroying everything around it. Bitcoin, we'll even use just Bitcoin. Bitcoin is destroying the financial world and you're being given this enormous tectonic shift. So why would you not take it? I think that's a great place to end. Change is coming. Why would you not take it? Um, thank you very much for your time, Raul Powell. I look forward to um, coming on Real Vision and also having you on in the future as this whole industry unfolds. Um, thank you for your content. I'm sure the viewers are going to really enjoy that. Yeah, thanks very much, Simon. And uh, we'll speak soon. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Bitcoin Hard Talk. We're excited about bringing more in the future and we've got a really exciting lineup. But I'd actually really like to hear who you'd like to see me talk with on Bitcoin Hard Talk. So why don't you tweet me and the person that you think should be on the show. You can tweet me at Simon Dixon Twit and also tweet the person that you think should be on the show and why they should be on it. Also, subscribe to this channel. It's Simon Dixon on YouTube. If you hit the bell symbol, then YouTube will give you notifications every time we go live with another episode of Bitcoin Hard Talk, plus my live AMAs and other updates as we watch the whole financial system unfold. And remember, no matter how bad it gets, you are alive at one of the most exciting times in financial history, and I wanna make sure that you're on the right side of that curve. Peace. Thank you.